Okay, well, it seems like most people have joined us here, so why don't we get started? Um, thank you everyone for joining us for our webinar today, From Trust to Taxes, What Real Estate Investors Need to Know Before Securing Financing. Today's presentation is jointly presented by the attorneys from Saul Ewing, Arnstein and & Lair and Ocean First Bank. We will dive in with a high-level discussion on recent developments and laws surrounding Delaware limited liability companies, limited partnerships, and corporations. 1031 exchanges, the Qualified Personal Residence Trust, and the Florida Homestead Exemption. My name is Rick Carroll, and I'm a partner in the firm's corporate practice, and I'm located in the, our Wilmington, Delaware, and Washington, D.C. offices. I am joined today by Suzanne Spizani and Rachel O'Keefe, both from Ocean First Bank. Suzanne is the president of the Philadelphia region, and Rachel is the director of trust and asset management for Ocean First. I am also joined by my colleagues and fellow presenters, <coughs> David Brown, counsel in the firm's personal wealth, estates, and trust practice, and he is located in our Philadelphia office, Jeffrey Friedman, who is a partner in the firm's real estate practice and is located in our Chicago office, and Eugene Pauling, who's a partner in the firm's personal wealth, estates, and trust practice, and is located in our West Palm Beach, Florida office. Now, before we begin, there are a few housekeeping announcements. Uh, Q&A. Questions can be submitted through the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen. We will do our best to answer all questions during the program. CLE credits. Today's program has been approved for CLE credit in Delaware, New Jersey, and New York, and Pennsylvania. As a CLE provider, we must be able to verify your attendance. So at random points during this webinar, we will display and verbally announce two numeric reporting codes that you must record and report back to us using the CLE verification survey that you received in your training reminder email. The survey will also open in your browser automatically at the conclusion of the webinar. We will in turn send you your certificate of attendance once we receive your survey response. Please be sure to respond to the CLE survey with your numeric codes within five days of the program. Now, uh, handouts and other materials. Earlier next week, or early next week, we, you will receive a thank you for participating <coughs> email that will include access to all training materials. And now, uh, last but not least, our legal disclaimer, the provision and receipt of the information in this program is not legal advice, does not create a lawyer-client relationship, and should not be acted on without seeking professional counsel who have been informed of the specific facts. And so with that, I'll turn this over to Suzanne. Thank you, Rick. Good morning, and thank you all for attending today. Ocean First is pleased to partner with Sol Ewing on today's topic of what real estate investors need to know before securing financing, which is a topic very close to our hearts. We appreciate the opportunity to collaborate on this topic um, with the U Saul Ewing attorneys that are going to address some recent developments, as Rick just indicated, on trust and taxes. By way of background, next slide, please. By way of background, Ocean First is an $11.5 billion regional bank headquartered um, in Red Bank. Uh, we were established in 1902. Uh, many of you might be familiar with the bank if you spend some time at the New Jersey shore, because our roots are really embedded in the New Jersey market. Over the past few years, our organization has really grown through acquisitions and organic growth into Philadelphia and New York. And in 2021, we further expanded into Boston and Baltimore. Next slide, please. We offer a full range of banking solutions to our commercial customers, uh, real estate customers and consumer customers. That include commercial and residential financing, treasury and deposit services. Rachel O'Keefe, who will, uh, leads our trust and asset management business, and will be joining us uh, later in the agenda for some closing comments. You'll have an opportunity to meet her as well. Uh, while we have 39 branches in our footprint, we have also been a leader among our peers in providing digital solutions to our customers, which has clear, clearly positioned us well um, to be open and serving our customers during the pandemic. I should mention that we were also a very active lender of PPP funds during the pandemic, um, supporting lending over $600 million um, and supporting over 75,000 jobs in our community. Next slide, please. I joined the bank in 2019 from a money center bank uh, to lead the expansion into greater Philadelphia. We've built an exceptional leadership team in greater Philadelphia, 
everyone's joined the bank for the same reason, that we wanted to get back to a more nimble and local decision-based approach to servicing our customers. Our greater Philadelphia teams all grew up and worked in this market their entire career. They know and understand the market and trends in real estate and can provide a lot of creative ideas for your, for your clients, financing and Hi, Suzanne, I think you went on mute. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm really sorry. <laughs> For some reason I clicked it. Um, to complement our Philadelphia commercial team, we're also opening a branch, if you could flip to the next slide. Next week, actually, in Center City, Philadelphia at 1500 Market Street. Please stop by if you're in the area. The branch will provide retail access for our customers that live, work, or do business in Philadelphia. Next slide, please. In terms of the commercial banking team, we offer customized lending and treasury solutions to commercial real estate developers and privately held businesses throughout our footprint. We know that one size doesn't fit all <clears throat> and we tailor solutions to the unique banking requirements of our customers. So what makes us really different from the other banks? We have money center banking capabilities and we execute and deliver like a community bank. So thank you for your time today, <clears throat> excuse me, and the opportunity to share the Ocean First Bank's mission to build relationships that empower clients to achieve their goals. And again, my thanks to the esteemed panel from Saul Ewing that you'll hear from shortly. So let me turn it back over to Rick Carroll. Great, thank you very much, Suzanne. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? <clears throat> All right, so um, our first presenter here will be uh, Dave Brown, who's going to be speaking about qualified personal residence trusts. All right, thanks, Rick. So uh, as Rick mentioned, I am a, uh, I'm a lawyer in the Philadelphia office and I, I in the personal wealth estates and trust group and so I saw you in. And so my perspective on, on this presentation talking about uh, what real, real estate investors should know is uh, qualified personal residence trusts. And this is, this is an estate planning topic uh, dealing with real estate. So I think the best way to, to start is to give a quick overview of where we are with the federal estate tax and, and why planning is important uh, to deal you know, with, to, to make sure we're getting the most out of our federal estate tax exemptions and, uh, and uh, doing appropriate planning with your real estate investments. So a, where we are with the, with the federal estate tax right now is that each person has a, an, a federal estate tax exemption amount of $11.7 million, which can be gifted uh, during lifetime or at death before any federal state tax is imposed. And there's been, that, that exemption will be reduced to $5 million plus inflation starting in January, 2026. So at the very least right now under current law, there's this, bound, there's this big exemption which can be used but will expire in 2026. So we're trying to do a lot now to help clients take advantage of the exemptions while they exist. In addition to the existing law, which we know is in place and should bring these exemptions back to a lower level, we, there's been a lot of current uh, talk about potential reductions in the exemption before 2026. And in fact, in the last, earlier this month, there was uh, legislation proposed, which would have brought that exemption to $6 million approximately at the beginning of next year. So this is a, a pressing topic and people are rightfully trying to make use of these exemptions while they still exist, while we know they exist, because really we don't know what the law will, will do uh, even in the very short term. So with that, one of the, one of the best ways to use it, well, not, not necessarily, but one of, the, one of the ways to use exemption is with a uh, qualified personal residence trust. And these, these are really creatures of the, of the, uh, the Internal Revenue Code. It's, there's a provision in the Internal Revenue Co Code that's section 2702, which in general provides that if, if a person makes a transfer in trust to a member of the person's family, and retains an interest in the trust, the, the value of the gift will be zero. And what that means is if you, if you take something, put in a trust like that, trying to use exemption, but because you've retained an interest, 
the gift tax value will be zero. So you won't, you won't actually use any of your exemptions. The code though provides a exception if, if, uh, if, you, if the transfer is of a personal residence. So there are, there are every, every piece of this has kind of its definitions. Transfer and trust means that there's one or more term holders and a member of the family, because it has to be the way this works if it's a transfer and trust to a, mem to a member of the family, uh, that, that causes this, this section to, to apply. A member of the family would include a spouse, an ancestor, a descendant, a spouse of any of those people, a brother or a sister, or a spouse of any of those people. So the, this allows you to, this, this kind of rule and exception allows this transfer in trust to a member of the family, so long as we're using a uh, personal residence. So what, what, this, what this means really is that there's an opportunity for planning here because you can make a transfer of a residence and, and contribute to a trust. And the, you're gonna end up moving the full value of the property out of your estate, but only be treated as a gift for, for the value of the remainder of the, after the term. So the transfer tax uh, attraction here is, is basically what I just said. You can transfer the full value of the property out, but the gift tax uh, cost is just the value of the property in some number of years after uh, the term the term of the trust expires. So, and the the attraction of this kind of planning uh, compared to a, a direct gift, which obviously would also get the property out of the estate, is that the person making creating the trust, the grantor, is the person creating the trust, the grantor can re can remain in the property during the term, can uh, you, can live in the property, can lease, can lease the property afterwards and retain some level of control. The, the, uh, the kind of catch is that at the end of the term, you have this property that you've been living in and now it is owned by someone or something else. And something else could be a trust, someone else could be the beneficiaries of the trust after the term. So if you wanna continue living there, most likely you have to pay some rent, which we'll get to in a little bit. Uh, next slide, please. So I guess the, the maybe the main, main uh, consideration in, in a qualified personal residence trust is what qualifies as a personal residence. And basically it can be the principal residence of the term holder. And the term, I keep, I'm gonna keep saying term holder, most likely that's gonna be the grantor slash creator of the trust. and so we're, we're dealing with some person's residence that they want to put into a trust of which, at least for the term, they're going to be the beneficiary, they're going to be the term holder. So the personal residence, what qualifies as a personal residence is the, either a principal residence, so where you, where you typically live, and one other res, or one other residence, or a fractional interest in either. So be, again, because this is kind of a creature of the Internal Revenue Code, we're limited in, in what we can do and really have to follow basically exactly what the code says here. And because, because there are these limitations of what qualifies as a personal residence at all, the maximum number of, of qualified personal residence trusts, uh, cuperts, by the way, is the, the, uh, the shortened term, is the maximum number of cuperts any one person can have is two. And if you have, if you have, two cuperts, one must be your actual principal residence. So it can't be, you know, you can't have, you know, you can't own five uh, investment properties, have two cuperts, and one of which is not one of your, was not your actual personal residence. A residence though can be things like, uh, can be uh, things like a shares of stock in a co-op. It can be a personal residence, even if you allow uh, if you allow guests, or even if you rent the property, sometimes it can still be a personal residence. The rule there is that the grantor must use the residence for uh, the greater of 14 days or the or 10 percent of the number of days that the residence is actually rented out. 
Uh, next slide, please. So uh, more on more on lines of what what might be a personal residence, though, is uh, there what other property, what additional property can be contributed? There have been lots of IRS rulings on this. Uh, you know, what's what's kind of too extravagant again? What's too extravagant to count as a personal residence? So we know from uh, private letter rulings from the IRS that the personal residence can include a main house and a guest house. We know that, it, that a personal residence can include a, a property with tennis court and swimming pool. We know that uh, you know, there's kind of no size limitation. 18, 18 acres is okay. There's a ruling specifically for uh, 63 acres with a single family residence, pool, pool house, greenhouse, tool shed, barn and living quarters for the caretakers of the animals. So uh, it's quite a big uh, exception and quite a big broad definition of what a personal residence can be treated as. We also know that mortgage property is okay. Mortgage property though would, would uh, just affect the value of the, the gift you're making obviously to be reduced by the amount of the mortgage owed. And the, the, uh, the other kind of key definition of personal residence is how it's used. And it's a personal residence so long as it's used as a residence by the term holder when the term holder is actually occupying the property. Um, okay, so we'll do a quick example here. And this is this is someone who, uh, if we have a client named Hannah who decides that she wants to you take advantage of her large uh, federal gift tax exemptions now, and but she like she wants to continue to live in her house, and but wants the value of that house out of her taxable estate. So what Hannah could do is take is create a cuper for for a period of 10 years. And let's flip the slide, please. So if if she let's, before surviving the 10 year term during the 10 year term of the Cooper, uh, the personal residence is there, Hannah continues to use the residence as as she always has. The term of the trust would provide that in, must provide actually that income is distributable to Hannah, Hannah at least annually. And in the in this case income uh, quote unquote is is mostly just the right to use the property. There can be no distributions to anyone else uh, other than Hannah during the during the term. And the only property that can be contributed to the to personal residence trust is the personal residence itself. There are exceptions to for ways to pay expenses and make improvements. In general, uh, that's a little bit more than than this presentation, but in general, it. Those, those contributions can be made to the trust, but also can be paid uh, directly. And then it's a, a, a question of whether there's an additional gift being made or not. So just to put some, some numbers on this, if assume Hannah's property was worth about a million dollars at the time she transfers it to the trust, and that in 10 years, uh, it would appreciate to $1.5 million. If Hannah, these are very, uh, approximate numbers just so that we weren't uh, too granul granular here. But if, if Hannah was 65 at the time of the transfer, her retained interest would be approximately $300,000. $300, so the taxable gift would be $700,000. That $700,000 would use a portion of Hannah's, uh, it would use a portion of Hannah's federal gift tax exemption. So it would just basically be subtracting $700 from the 11.7. .7. So there would be, so assuming she has exemption left, there would be no gift tax on it. So, and for a, basically for a transfer of $700,000 of, of gift tax value, she would remove $1.5 million from her estate because she gets out the, the property at the time, the value that is at the time it's transferred, but also all future appreciation is, is removed from her estate. So really uh, a, a tax cost of $700,000, she removes a $1.5 million asset from her estate. And obviously, as we talked about with the differences of what residents might be, what residences might be, uh, the values here you know, can be 
less than this or far, far greater and use, you know, much more, much, much bigger portion of the federal state, tax, federal state tax exemption if, if that was the goal. So the, uh, I want to think about it from the, from the gift tax, estate tax and income tax uh, consequences here. For gift tax, the gift tax considerations are pretty much what I just talked about, which is uh, you're making this gift, you get, unlike the standard rule of, of 2702, you get, you get uh, credit for what you've, what you've actually gifted, which is the value of the remainder. And this, when I'm talking about the value of the remainder, that is just valued under the IRS tables for, you know, basically the IRS gives this 7520 rate it's called and, and you apply that to the, to the term, the age of the grantor, and you, you know, the, basically the IRS uh, internal revenue code tells us what the value is after a certain term. So that the million dollars turning into uh, $300,000 would be, that's all just determined by, you know, plugging in numbers to the, into what the internal, internal revenue code tells us. So for, for gift tax, you, she's used, by making this gift, she's used, she's used some portion of her federal gift tax exemption at the end of the term. So the, the estate tax works in connection with the uh, federal gift tax, uh, which is, you know, whatever, whatever gift tax exemption you didn't use during your lifetime, you have as a federal estate tax exemption at your death. If the grantor of Hannah were to die in the middle of this term, the property likely would be returned to her estate and would then still be included in her estate uh, for federal estate tax purposes. In some ways that, that means you've, we've not accomplished the goal, which was to get this out of her estate, but we, she would get credit for any gift tax paid or any exemption used during her life. So it's almost like there's no kind of no harm, no foul th thing here, where if she doesn't survive, uh, the property just gets included in her estate as it would have been if she didn't even try this transaction. So the only kind of negative there would be, you know, the costs associated with creating the trust itself and transferring the, the residence to the trust, which by the way, would be typically just done by a deed from Hannah to uh, herself as trustee. Uh, there is one thing to consider here in the estate tax rules, which is something called the reciprocal, reciprocal trust doctrine so that we can't have Hannah and her husband, for example, both make uh, trusts for each other with undivided interest in the same property that look exactly like each other, like that when the trusts look exactly the same or very, very similar, the IRS will look through that and kind of unwind the trusts. And basically the, another instance of acting like it just didn't happen. Uh, for uh, income tax purposes, the, the trusts would be structured during Hannah's lifetime as though she were the, still the owner of the property. So she's, she's gonna be living in here. She, there'll be no difference from an income tax perspective uh, from between her and her Cooper. So it's, it's kind of a very easy tax reporting for, from an income tax standpoint because there's, from the IRS's perspective, there's been no change. At the end of the term though, that could change. The trust would then be a separate, uh, separate uh, taxpayer and would be you know, responsible for paying its own income taxes. At, at, the end of, at the end of the trust term, there are, there are a couple things to consider, which is whether the property at that time, so, so now we're, we're at the end of the, when we get to when Hannah survives a 10-year term, the consideration has to be put into what happens then. And next slide, please. Okay, if, if Hannah decides she wants to stay in the residence, this is her, her home and she wants to stay there, uh, this is one of the, the catches to this and, and something that, that uh, you know, people don't always love when it, when it actually happens is now she's in a place that she no longer owns. Either her trust does, if, if the trust is continuing past the 10 year term or the beneficiary of the trust own the property if the trust provides for it the uh, distribution outright at that time. So if she, either way, 
if Hannah is going to live there, she has to pay rent. She either has to pay rent to the trust itself, or she has to pay rent to whoever the owners are, which is going to likely be her spouse or her children or whoever the other beneficiaries might be. And rent is determined as uh, uh, rent has to be determined. It has to be a fair market value rent. We typically, uh, when this happens, we typically get a realtor to tell us to appraise the property and tell us what the fair market value rent would be. And uh, again, because these are so technical with respect to following the code, the uh, internal revenue code, we need to just really be certain that every, you know, every kind of hurdle is met and paying fair market value rent on time and consistently is something that will be checked and something that, you know, is very important to make sure we keep up with. The, again, I, I mentioned that the end of the trust could be either in trust or outright the, to the beneficiaries. There, there are, you know, there are pros and cons to any, to either decision. The, the pro obviously of giving it outright is that someone owns it. You no longer have any issues with maintaining a trust or anything like that. You have people, and especially if Hannah doesn't want to live there, it's very easy now. Her, her beneficiaries can just own this residence and they own it outright and don't have to worry about anything. Uh, there, there are some that real good benefits to it remaining in trust though, uh, which is one of the most important ones is uh, uh, creditor protection planning. Uh, anything in the trust is protected from uh, creditors if well, well in trust. And well, while in the, uh, the trust, if, uh, if for example, Hannah's spouse was the, bene was the beneficiary of the trust and, and at the end of the trust term, uh, the, it could be the, the spouse could stay there. And if, if nice, this, her spouse might allow Hannah to stay there with, with him or her. So, uh, so that's one way to, to kind of avoid this property being taken away from Hannah at the end of the trust term. Uh, if if uh, if Hannah ends up renting this property from from either a trust or a beneficiary, uh, again I mentioned it had to be fair market value rent, but it also needs to uh, we need to make sure that uh, that uh, sorry if uh, I'm sorry if there if there was a, if it's a grantor trust still there might be there's a chance to pay. Uh, there's a chance that the income tax isn't taxed to, to the trust. It might still be taxed by Hannah. And uh, further for, for estate tax planning and, and gift tax planning, all the rent that she pays, uh, it's not necessarily looked as a positive for, from uh, until you flip it from this perspective, but the rent that she pays is uh, a further contribution to whoever the beneficiaries are without any gift tax considerations. There is, there's, potentially income tax being paid by the recipient there because obviously they're earning uh, income. Uh, one other planning consideration when you're, when you're, when Hannah is building this trust is who should be the trustee and the, the simplest and easiest and, and probably most common during her, during the term is for Hannah to, to be the trustee. She can be the sole trustee uh, and, and it just simplifies a lot of things for you know, management it's, it's basically, as I said, like she's still owning the, the property. After, after the trust term, uh, the, she should stop, to, she should cease being trustee, depending if it depends on the terms of the trust, but there's a possibility that her, if she has too much discretion over how the trust is distributed, that if she as trustee has too much discretion, this again could pull the, the entire trust back into her taxable estate, which is what we're trying to avoid. Um, so that is that is really it for for my presentation. So I will well let me let me add that the next the next step as I put it here would be to uh, to create you know another one would be uh, if we're successful why not uh, create another one if she has the uh, property to do it and wants to take further advantage of her gift tax exemptions. But uh, thank you very much. I hope uh, I hope uh, that was useful. Great. Thank, thanks a lot, Dave. I really appreciate that. Um, it doesn't look like we have any questions in the chat box, but just as a reminder, if anyone has any questions to the presenters, feel free to uh, 
type them into the Q&A uh, box at the bottom of your screens. Uh, so next up, we're going to be having uh, Jeff Friedman uh, speak about uh, 1031 like-kind exchanges. Jeff. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Rick. Thank you, Ocean First, and thank you to my partners at Saul Ewing for including me in this presentation. Um, I have to apologize in advance if my audio isn't great. <laughs> Thankfully, I'm a lawyer and not a technology person. Um, and a few additional housekeeping notes. Um, I'm going to speak on 1031s, not from the perspective of an accountant or a tax attorney. I'm what you'd call a traditional dirt lawyer, a real estate, you know, commercial real estate lawyer. I have done, uh, dare I say, dozens and dozens and dozens of 1031 exchanges in my career so far. Um, and so I was invited to speak to you today about 1031 like kind exchange. I would also like to add, uh, as far as legislative updates, um, there has been talk as part of President Biden's Build Back Better plan that there are new limitations to be imposed on um, 1031 exchanges. And as we'll see, we're going to get into uh, some of the nuts and bolts of 1031 exchanges, but the limitations as a pay for for the Build Back Better bill would be to cap the amount of deferral on capital gain and or depreciation or capture tax for taxpayers, single filers at a half a million dollars and a million dollars for joint filers. Uh, so far in what I've seen, that is that is not part of the plan the plan is to increase taxes elsewhere and not uh and not cap taxes in the exchange world uh as you might imagine the exchange world accounts for uh billions of dollars of real estate being transferred annually in this country and uh dare i say thousands and thousands of people are employed in the industry which would include lawyers accountants bankers, um, title companies, surveyors, environmental consultants, and so on. And so the industry, the real estate industry was mobilized when this was first suggested to, uh, to speak to their legislators and express their concern that perhaps there are other areas that could be looked at that would be far more lucrative as a pay for, for Biden's agenda uh, in lieu of impacting like kind of exchanges. So uh, let's go to the first slide. Okay, so let's talk about the nuts and the bolts of a like kind exchange. Section 26 of the US code, excuse me, 26 US code section 1031 allows taxpayers, they're referred to as exchangers, to dispose of investment or business use real property to acquire replacement property and to defer tax typically due upon sale. Uh, the two taxes would include capital gain and any depreciation or capture for tax deferral during the period of ownership of the property held for investment or used productively in a trade or business. Okay, so I can buy like kind replacement property uh, that's held for investment or used productively in trade or business. Um, it must be of equal or greater value. And we'll unpack a lot of these concepts as I'm talking. Um, it, you must reinvest all of your equity into the replacement property in order to avail yourself as the taxpayer exchange or of the benefit of deferring all of your capital gain and or depreciation or capture tax. Um, nowhere in the code is the word boot mentioned, but boot is the money I receive as a taxpayer that would be taxable because, for instance, uh, on this first concept, uh, if, I, if I sell what's called a relinquished property, that is the property that I relinquished, uh, that I sold and re at a million dollars, and I invested in a half a million dollar property, now, the math will be more complicated than this in reality, but in my example, 
I have half a million dollars in boot that would be taxable, uh, perhaps on the long-term capital gain basis and or any, you know, based on any depreciation or capture um, for that sale. I have to reinvest all the equity and I have to uh, provide, I have to obtain the same amount or greater debt on my replacement property. If I have no debt, great. I put all my equity into my acquisition. If I have uh, a million and a half dollar property that's encumbered by a half a million dollars in debt, I need to replace that debt. I can't actually or constructively, uh, next, uh, next idea is that I cannot actually constructively receive any of the money or property that does not meet the requirements of section 1031. Okay, next slide, please. So um, this, for those of you who are seeking to obtain CLE, please take note at the bottom of this slide, you need to jot down this number. It's CLE code number one. Uh, just a reminder, you'll be receiving two codes that you'll need to submit through the system. And this first code, please take note of it. Uh, and I'll, I'll stay on this slide for a bit, but this number is 13579. 13579. Okay. So what is qualified like-kind property? There's a two-pronged test in uh, the code and the regs. The relinquished property, the property to be sold, and the replacement property, the property to be purchased, must be held by the taxpayer exchange or for investment purposes or for productive use in a trade or business. Okay. Real property that's held primarily for sale uh, inventory does not qualify. Okay. That is, if I uh, if I am one of these uh, investor types who buys up land and I uh, perhaps I do some zoning changes to position this land and I, I subdivide the land and uh, my business is doing that and then I sell off these plots of land, then I might be selling primarily inventory and that wouldn't qualify to on the sale of those parcels to you know replace, on a tax-free basis. Uh, also, uh, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act limited like-kind property to real property. There was a time before the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act where you could exchange equipment for equipment, uh, or that's just an example, but it doesn't matter. That no longer exists. It's no longer available. We are focused solely on real property. Okay. Next slide, please. The um, relinquished property and the replacement property have to be like kind. And the code tells us that's in nature, not grade or quality. In other words, all real property in the United States, all domestic US property, real property is like kind to all domestic US property. Some examples. Of property that qualifies. Raw land or farmland is exchanged for improved real property. Uh, oil and gas royalties are exchanged for a ranch. Now, why are oil and gas royalties considered a property? Well, uh, let's say I'm in Oklahoma and my oil and gas royalties are considered under state law real property. The U.S. Code will recognize that as US is real property for purposes of a like kind exchange, those oil and gas royalties. I'll give some additional examples. Uh, in Colorado, water rights, as long as the water is not severed from the source, it's not drawn from a river or a stream, uh, are considered, uh, and this is well established in Colorado, uh, I say this because I'm licensed in Colorado incidentally, um, as considered uh, real property in some other places, uh, timber rights, uh, crops, they can be considered real property, again, as long as they're not severed from the source. Once they're severed from the source, then they're considered, you know, something else. They're not considered real property any longer. They're considered uh, 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 goods. So <clears throat> uh, some additional examples listed here, you see residential, commercial, industrial, or retail rental property for other property. This recently, another one came up recently. A client asked me, can I sell my 
commercial lot where I park vehicles um, for, can I, can I take the proceeds from that relinquished property and acquire a vacation home? Um, and uh, clever. And so the answer is, there is a safe harbor in the revenue procedures. It's 2001-16 that says that uh, you can do this, but you need to strictly follow the revenue procedure that says the replacement property, the vacation home has to be held for at least 24 months after the sale of the relinquished property, okay? And in each of the 12 month periods within that 24 months, the taxpayer has to rent the property at fair rental for 14 days or more, and the taxpayer's personal use can't exceed the greater of 14 days or 10% of the number of days it was rented at fair rental. So if you're like me here in the Midwest, you know, a uh, home on a lake is a really attractive thing unless it's, you know, 20 below zero, and maybe it's not as easy to rent it when it's 20 below zero. So uh, in the Sunbelt states, you could imagine this might be an easier um, revenue procedure safe harbor to avail oneself of. Um, but it was an interesting question that came up with the client. And so uh, we looked at it. What are examples of unqualified property? Well, this sort of harkens back to what I was alluding to before. Um, changes uh, both uh, in the tax code itself, but also what it, what it allows specifically. So stock and trade or other property held primarily for sale. So if I'm a developer or I'm a flipper or I'm a dealer, um, like my earlier example, that would not be qualified property. Stocks, bonds, notes, uh, partnership interests cannot be exchanged for partnership interests. And that can get uh, tricky. I might touch on that later if we have time. Um, foreign real property for domestic US real property, not qualified, goodwill for goodwill again not considered real property under the code and therefore uh, would not qualify. Let's go to the next, let's go to the next, uh, thank you. Um, one, one thing before I get into this slide is that who, you know, who is the taxpayer? I mean, this is an important part of the structuring when considering whether to do a 1031 like kind exchange. So the taxpayer, I'll use myself as an example. I have a limited liability, I'm going to use a fairly simple example. Uh, I have a limited liability company. Uh, it's Jeff Friedman LLC. And Jeff Friedman LLC owns a 64 unit apartment building. It's income producing, great, um, you know, nearing retirement. And I want to sell it. Um, and I want to buy, you know, a grocery store. In other words, I don't, I'm tired of managing an apartment building. I want to buy a grocery store. Okay. Uh, I will get into you know sort of the structuring here, but I do all the things correctly. Um, and when I take title, I my LLC, since I am the sole member for tax purposes, is considered disregarded. That was made basic, you know, to some of you accountants out there, whatever. But it's a dis or, or sophisticated attorneys, forgive me. So it's a disregarded entity. So technically speaking, Jeff Friedman. I could take title to the replacement property and my exchange would be deemed uh, qualified under the code. Um, or I could take title under Jeff Friedman LLC, or theoretically, I could even form a new LLC of which Jeff Friedman LLC is the sole member or Jeff Friedman is the sole member. So just something to understand. It gets more complex, of course, if you have partners in a deal, right? And you're selling your relinquished property. And we, if we have time, time permitting, there's a lot of material. But if time permitting, we can talk a little bit about um, uh, either you're going to exchange with the same set of partners, you know, whatever it is, two people are invested 50 50 or 70 30 or whatever, or you have a whole host of limited, in, you know, partners who are invested in a property and, uh, you know, they're just following your lead because you're the smart investor. Uh, you're the, you know, some people that, throw around terminology, you're the GP, but um, you know you need to bring along every partner unless you do some advanced planning uh, in order to, if those partners no longer wanna continue to invest with you, they wanna go their own way, they wanna take their money off the table, then you need to either do some advanced planning or there's some, you know, 
tricks of the trade. Again, I'm not an accountant. I'm not a tax attorney. I consult with those folks as we structure. I'll try to see if I can touch on some of that stuff, again, time permitting, but um, things to think about. Okay, now, like kind exchange timing, basics. The identification period is 45 days after the sale date of your relinquished property. These dates, by the way, that I'm going to cite to you, they're hard and fast, okay? The courts are not, and the IRS is not sympathetic to someone who misses any of these dates. And they're really two key dates, the 45-day identification period, and we'll get into the next one in a moment. There are two ways to identify replacement property. The first, you can see on the, on the uh, slide here, is to actually acquire the replacement property within the 45-day identification period, and the IRS will recognize that as a proper identification. Next slide, please. The next would be to, and this is far more common, to designate the property as replacement property in a written document that is signed by the taxpayer and delivered, here it notes, this is from the regs, hand-delivered, or mailed, faxed, antiquated, uh, or otherwise sent before the end of the identification period to either um, a person who's the, per the person who's obligated to transfer the replacement property to the taxpayer, regardless of whether that person is disqualified, which we discussed below, that is the seller, or perhaps uh, an exchange accommodator um, in a reverse exchange, or any other person involved in the exchange other than the taxpayer or a disqualified person. Who are dis Disqualified persons are important. I've had this come up in deals. I've had it suggested that a banker or a broker would act as, uh, the term is a qualified intermediary, and we'll get into that in a moment, um, to hold the money for the exchange. Um, and uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. But disqualified people are agents of the taxpayer, okay? If an agent of the taxpayer holds the funds from the sale of the relinquished property, and all this, by the way, we're talking about relinquished property and trading into a replacement property, that's called a forward exchange. Um, kind of jumping around on my outline, but it matters uh, just for context. So so if, if I'm Jeff Friedman is going to uh, enter into one of these exchanges, if I ask Joe, my CFO, hey, Joe, hold the money for me for my exchange when I sell you know, this commercial property for that commercial property, that's a no-no. Okay, that's a taxable, that is not an exchange, that's a taxable transfer. My Jeff Friedman's attorney uh, can't hold the money. Jeff Friedman's in bank, investment banker or broker can't hold the money. Jeff Friedman's agent, real estate agent, can't hold the money. Uh, you can look to the control tests uh, in the section cited here on, these, on this slide um, to determine who those parties are who would be considered disqualified, but I think I've given you, I mean, agent is really um, the analysis and, uh, and there are much better ways of doing a like kind of exchange than trying to use any of these parties anyway, which we'll talk about. Okay, qualified parties do include, however, uh, escrow companies, title companies, and banks who are not disqualified. And uh, I cite these as examples because they have uh, many uh, escrow companies, title companies, and banks who are not disqualified have a like-kind exchange program and follow the protocols to ensure that your deal qualifies as a like-kind exchange. Okay, um, let's see. So we've talked about, let's move to the next slide, please. Okay, what does your notice have to say when you're identifying your replacement property as the taxpayer? Okay, it has to unambiguously describe the real the, what it is you're buying. So the guidance is legal description, which I, I think is always the safest route. A street address, you you know, frankly, you won't do two of three. If you have the or four or four or five, three, excuse me, of uh, the example cited here. If you've got a legal description, a street address, and a distinguishable name, I am going to buy the you know Willis Tower in Chicago, and I have its legal description and it's on Wacker and the exact address is escaping me, but if I put all that information into the notice, great. Um, but I would say the strongest would be legal description, um, street address certainly, or distinguishable name, 
uh, as cited here, the Empire State Building. Okay, now I can identify as a taxpayer, I can identify more than one replacement property, um, regardless of the number of relinquished properties that I'm transferring as part of the same exchange. In other words, I may be transferring a portfolio of properties and I've, I've been engaged in a transaction where a client sold its business, which included hundreds, hundreds of, of properties that it was selling to the buyer. Um, and so the, uh, the maximum number of replacement properties that you can identify though is three without regard to the fair market value of those three properties or any number provided that the aggregate fair market value does not exceed 200% of the aggregate fair market value of all of the relinquished properties as of the date that those relinquished properties were sold. Um, this can be a little tricky. And you can imagine that a seller knows uh, or may learn at some point in a transaction, if it's hard to keep it quiet, that uh, their buyer is a, an exchange buyer. And so timing becomes an issue and you know it's a hot market right now, and because of this threat of change to uh, uh, the pay for notion, you know, from the Biden agenda to uh, to limit to cap how much deferral um, on gain can be sheltered in this uh, in, in acquiring a replacement property, folks uh, have been rushing to do exchanges, and so sellers are weary because they think, well, I'm one of three properties identified on a sheet, you know, in this 45 day period. I may not be the lucky seller, but I don't want to take this property off the market for that long. Um, and so I've seen a lot of things worked into contracts, as you might imagine, that you know my, my clients might be leaving money on the table. Um, they might be considered in default, you know, if they don't uh, uh, if they terminate even within the due diligence period, it's gotten aggressive, uh, to say the least, in this market. It's a very frothy market. Um, because of because of the concerns with the changes in the code. Okay, um, moving along. Let's see. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, you are treated taxpayers treated as if no replacement properties identif identified if you've identified more pro properties than permitted, unless uh, any replacement property is received before the end of the forty five day identification period, or any replacement property that you timely identify within that 45 days is acquired if you receive as um, identified property, fair market value of which is 95% of the aggregate fair market value of all the identified replacing property. So then you fall within, uh, call it a, you know, a safety net so that you don't blow your exchange. Okay, and here's the other thing. Um, what if, what if I'm negotiating a contract with a seller and I'm getting a bad taste in my mouth and I, my ID, my 45 day identification period hasn't ended. I don't like the seller. I'm concerned, but I've identified the property within the first 15 days of my 45 day ID period. And I'm on day 36 of my 45 day, 45 day ID period. Well, the code tells us that the replacement property identifications can be revoked, revoked at any time before the end of the identification period, as long as you do that in writing, you sign it and you deliver it in accordance with uh, you know, what's in the code there, delivered, mailed, faxed, or otherwise, before the end of the ID period. So the person to whom the identification of the replacement property was sent, and then you can even replace it. You can do this as many times as you want within that 45 days. Okay, so there, then you're covered. Uh, next slide, please. I'm doing that time. Um, the exchange period. This is that other date that is hard set in stone that the IRS takes no mercy on you, nor do the courts if you blow it. Your exchange period, in other words, once you've sold your replacement property, you have the earlier of 180 days after the date of the sale of the relinquished property to acquire the replacement property, or your filing deadline for the year that you sold the replacement property. Now, this can get tricky because you can imagine if I sell my replacement property later in the year, in October, November, December, I may have a shorter period because my filing date comes up quickly in the coming year, if it does, unless there's an automatic extension and then I have the full 180 days. 
just something to keep tucked in the back of your mind. It's not just you're guaranteed 180 days. The ID replacement property has to be received before the end of the exchange period, or it is, excuse me, received before the end of the exchange period. If you receive it before the end of the exchange period, or uh, I'm sorry, the taxpayer receives it, and uh, it's substantially the same as the property identified. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, um, I was, I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to get jammed up on time, so I'm going to skip some stuff. But the highlight here is, you know, uh, and I've had this conversation with clients, and, and it makes them nervous, and, and understandably so. You cannot receive money or other property uh, to as a taxpayer, as I touched on earlier, to qualify for a like kind of exchange. So if you do, if, if you receive cash or other consideration, um, then you've blown your exchange. Uh, and I don't expect you to sit here and read this whole thing, but um, there are some safe harbors. I do want to get into one of them at least, um, but you are considered uh, you know, for purposes of receipt of money to be an actual receipt or uh, of money or property at the time that you do receive money or property, or you receive the economic benefit of the money or property, and you are in constructive receipt of money or property at the time the money or property is credited to an account, it's set apart for you, uh, or otherwise made available to you, and you could draw upon it such that you have control over that money. Okay, so it's very important that um, you not be in receipt of the money. Uh, this, in one instance, I had a client who I, I touched upon this was selling hundreds of properties, I think valued at uh, $250 million. Okay, and so um, the client, you know, the, the $250 million had to go into an exchange account, and the client rightfully was concerned that, wait a second, How's my money going to be insured under FDIC? Because FDIC only insures two hundred fifty thousand dollars in a deposit amount at a depository bank. So if I had multiple accounts at Chase of two hundred fifty thousand dollars, I'm only insured. Let's say I have you know four accounts of a million dollars, each one had two hundred fifty thousand dollars. I'm only insured for two hundred fifty thousand um, dollars. So one, uh, I'm going to get into what a qualified intermediary is in a moment, but uh, one of my clever qualified intermediaries said, well, I have a relationship with Bank of New York and Bank of New York has a captive company uh, called Promontory. And what Promontory does is it identif you identify where you have deposits. It will avoid those depository banks. And it has relationships with hundreds of banks and it deposits no more than $250,000 in each of those banks. And it's seamless as far as the taxpayer is concerned. Promontory controls all the relationships and the money's drawable at any time and it's guaranteed. Um, and you know, there's insurance and there's a bond and to back that up. And, uh, and that's what we did. Uh, that's what we did in one instance when we were depositing $250 million, we spread it out through Promontory um, to ensure that that money was safe. And you give up a little bit on rate on return um, uh, for the deposit period in exchange for security. Okay, let's move on. Next slide, please. Okay, so I was speaking about safe harbors. So, and I mentioned qualified intermediaries. You can, uh, as a taxpayer, the transfer of your relinquished property and the succeeding receipt of like kind of replacement property is treated as an exchange qualified under the code. And the determination of whether you were in receipt actually or constructively of money or other property um, is made as if the qualified intermediary is not the agent of the taxpayer. So uh, I use a company, let's say, called Accruit out of Denver. Uh, what Accruit does is acts as a qualified intermediary. I have no relationship with Accruit. I don't control Accruit. Um, they're not my agent. And I can't demand my money back from Accruit. Um, and we'll get into an uh, exchange agreement um, if, uh, it, it, even if I wanted it back, okay? So, so therefore I fall within a safe harbor. I haven't actually or constructively come into receipt of the money from the sale of my replacement property, just thereby disqualifying my exchange. Now the safe harbor only applies if the agreement between me, the taxpayer and the qualified intermediary expressly limits my ability to receive, pledge, borrow, or otherwise obtain the benefits of the money or other property held by the qualified intermediary. 
Well, I can assure you that for folks who have not engaged in like-kind exchanges, this becomes a major concern because there are hefty violations in place that restrict when a qualified intermediary can release the funds held in an exchange account. Um, and this is commonly known as G6, and that's part of the treas regs, but the taxpayer can't, as I identified here, can't receive any of that money, can't touch it. And you enter into an exchange agreement with the qualified intermediary that says that amongst other things that as the taxpayer exchanger, I will not receive the funds until the end of the exchange period, regardless of the circumstances. And, um, and if it doesn't include these G6 limitations, then the safe harbor is not satisfied and the intermediary is not considered a qualified intermediary. And I can draw back my money uh, just quickly here. I think I'm running out of time. I might go over a minute or two, but I can draw back my money within the identification period and pay the tax. But if we get past the 45 day identification period, I have, according to the contract, I have to, with the qualified intermediary, I need to leave the money in there for 180 days. I lose use of it, even though I intend to use it, pay taxes on it and use it for something else. This gives many of my clients a lot of consternation. Here's the problem. If the qualified intermediary said to you on day 90, sure, here's your money back, then they're considered your agent. If they're considered your agent, they may be disqualified as a qualified intermediary on the tens or hundreds of other transactions in which they're holding these funds for other uh, like kind exchanges. They're not going to take that risk, right? And so to blow the exchanges of other other investors, uh, other taxpayer exchangers. And so this is something that uh, something that you need to go over with your clients so that they understand that if they decide not to do the deal, make that decision quickly within the ID period or understand that for a half a year, your money may be earning interest, but it's gonna sit in an account until you can get it. Um, so qualified intermediary incidentally, uh, just kind of get through that quickly is, is not the taxpayer or a disqualified person and enters into this written agreement. And um, let's see, I think I'm running out of time. I wanted to highlight, if we move on to the next slide very quickly, um, there are various types of exchanges. Uh, simultaneous means I have uh, I have a deed, my, uh, my friend Dave has a deed, we hand each other deeds, that's it. We, we simultaneously made an exchange. What I've been describing to you are forward exchanges for the most part. Um, you can also do a reverse exchange. I won't get into all the detail, um, but a reverse exchange means I buy my replacement property first, and then I sell my relinquished property. There's a structure for that in the revenue procedures. Uh, I've run out of time. I don't really have a chance to get into how that's all done. You can also do a build to suit. Again, uh, I am buying a property that's not completely, it's not finished, or it's going to be constructed during the period of the reverse or, or forward exchange. There are ways to do that. Um, they're not perfect, but there are ways to do that. Uh, I wanted to speak for a moment about advanced planning. You know, it may not be worthwhile to do a like kind exchange for you. And you need to sit with your tax professionals, your accountants and your lawyers and say, you know, if I have a piece of property that was gifted to me by in a trust, uh, a piece of real property that was gifted to me, commercial uh, held for investment, gifted to me in a trust from my uh, parents. And uh, what happens is uh, when it's conveyed to me, I get a step at their death, I get a stepped up basis. So if uh, there's zero basis in this property, because they've been depreciating the asset for the 40 years that they've owned this apartment, let's say it's an apartment complex, on the date of their death, I get it, you know, for, uh, I get no gain on that transfer, because the basis goes from zero to the fair market value of that asset. You know, if I go and sell it, uh, six months later, the only tax I'm gonna pay is the difference between the stepped up basis and maybe an additional you know, increase in fair market value. I, I may not wanna do an exchange. It's a complicated tra transaction to enter into for, for very little benefit. On the other hand, if I have depreciated an asset that I've held for a long time um, that uh, has a lot of gain deferral built into it and long-term capital gain tax on it, without getting into an example, because I've run, run out of time, you know, then I probably want to engage in an exchange. There's another slide. Um, all I want to do is tell you that there are ways with uh, in structuring if partner, if you want to break up a partnership um, on the disposition of an asset, uh, timing is, you know, if you can get to your 
tax professionals soon are great, um, you know, at predisposition, predisposition, at disposition, or even after uh, uh, on the disposition of an asset and on acquiring, you can come in with other investors through tenancy and common structures, land trusts in some states like Illinois, where I am, Florida, Arizona, and others, uh, investments in Delaware statutory trusts, which would permit multiple different investors to invest in a property, one property, but um, because of the, the IRS recognizes that akin to a tenancy in common that you have a right in the whole, then um, you're not you're not disqualified as a, a as a uh, exchanger. Uh, I can't emphasize that enough. Consult with your tax professionals early and often, and analyze and manage in advance for maximum flexibility in your exchange. I wish I had more time. A lot of material. Thank you for um, I thank you for listening to me. Great. Th thanks a lot for that, Jeff. Um, we just have a couple of questions from the audience, and I uh, hope you might be able to answer for us okay. here. Okay. Uh, the first one is, uh, can an attorney acting as the exchange agent provide legal services to the taxpayer, um, uh, such as setting up a Delaware statutory trust mechanism? I would say don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I would say don't do it because, because you, are, you are an agent you will be deemed an agent by the IRS. Mm -hmm. And if you're not, and if even if you win that court battle, do you really want to be in it, right? Don't mm -hmm. use use a qualified or new intermediary. Uh, that's my advice. Great, great. And then the uh, the second question, um, can an exchange agent buy T-bills to avoid the risk of FDIC limitations? Uh, uh, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, you know, I do know that the money does get invested and uh, it, it can be put in an interest-bearing account, which is interesting because here you have funds from a sale that's increased, the funds are increasing in value. So the answer is maybe, but I don't know the answer. Great. <laughs> All right. If someone wants to email me, I'm happy to look into it for them. And that email is Jeff, Jeffrey, J-E-F-F-R-E-Y dot Friedman, F-R-I-E-D-M-A-N at Saul.com. Perfect, perfect. All right, thanks a lot, Jeff. Thanks. All right, uh, uh, ne next up, uh, uh, our, our next presenter is Eugene Pollan, who is going to be speaking about the Florida homestead exemption. Eugene? Hello? Um Yes, we, we can hear you. I think I'm here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I'm just trying to adjust my camera. Huh? It looks like it's, can you hear me? Because it seems like my, it's frozen. That's all right. We can still hear you, I believe. Wait a minute, I think I'm. For some reason I can't start the video. That, that, that's all right. If you can, if you can just speak, we can we, we can hear you fine, and we can see the slides just fine. Okay. I don't know what happened to my the eye, but I, this thing that launched to me, I don't want to launch it again. I might get cut off. So if you hear me, I'm just going to start talking. Uh -huh. So Florida has good asset protection laws. In fact, I've had clients who moved down to Florida just because they're having debt problems with with, with creditors. They'll, they'll move down to Florida just to put themselves in a better position to, to, to deal with their debts. Well, one, one of the most well-known asset protection features of Florida is the Florida Homestead Protection Law. And in Florida, if you, under the right circumstances, your, your house cannot be touched by, by creditors regardless of the value of the house. Even if it's worth multi-millions of dollars, they can't touch it if you qualify. Well, the the, the, the Actually, though the the homestead protection features of the credit protection features is just one of the one of the aspects of Florida homestead. There are actually three different aspects of Florida homestead, all with the policy in mind of protecting the homestead, protecting your uh, how much taxes you pay on the homestead, protecting your family when you die that it passes to your to your your wife or your dependent children without without anybody else taking it or creditors getting to it or actually preventing you to from leaving it to somebody else and then kicking your your children out. So so I'm I'm, I'm gonna so I'm gonna there I'm gonna talk about these three different aspects of of homes of homestead law in Florida. The first one is the 
the Florida Homestead Creditor Protection. Okay, well, the, the rules are, are, are simple. For your house to be protected from the homestead, it has to, it has to, if it's in the city limits, it has to be on one half acre of land or less. If it's outside of the city limits, it has to be on 160 contig contiguous acres or less. Okay, now it has to be your primary residence. It has to be in your name. It can't be in the name of a, a, an entity like an LLC or something else. And it's and 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 the and the most important aspect here is that if you put your if you put money into a homestead when creditors are coming after you, it's not a fraudulent transfer. There's a concept where if I'm if the creditors are coming after me and suing me and I and I, I can't uh, and I you know and and, uh, and I put things out of out of their reach or I, I put it in uh, give it away. Well, if, if that's considered a fraud, fraudulent transfer, and, and the creditors can attack that. But the the the, the, the homestead is such a strong public policy in Florida, protecting the homestead. That even if you at the last minute to take take your take your money and, and put it in the homestead, even though that would be a fraudulent transfer, normally, if, since it's going to the homestead, it's it's protected. There's a Florida Supreme Court that says that. Where somebody specifically put money in their homestead just to, to get out of the reach of creditors. It was the, the people, the, the creditors were coming after them. There was a lawsuit and the court said, that's okay. The only, the only real exception to this is if, if, the, if the money you're putting into the homestead is, is money acquired by ill-gotten gains, like you can't rob a bank and put it in the homestead and, and that, that would probably not work. So, so let's say, okay, so what, what, um, what happens if your if your home is on more than half an acre in the city limits? Well, the half an acre is still exempt, but the rest is not. So, for example, if the home were on three quarters of an acre, the creditor could could seize the, the home, have it sold. But since 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 half an acre is protected and it's the the whole acreage was three quarters of an acre, the homeowner would keep two thirds of the proceeds. That that's what relates to his half acre, and then. The, the credit would only get one third of the proceeds, which relates to the to the one third acre. Now, if the if the home is on 160 acres or less outside of the city limits, then that's grandfathered. So, if that would in, in in at some future date become incorporated into a city, the the hundred the whole 160 acres are still exempt. Okay. Um. And an, an, another feature here is. If you sell your homestead and you and you're planning on reinvesting it in another homestead, if you if you take the, that those proceeds and segregate them, and then they're sitting there waiting to be reinvested, they can the, those proceeds continue to keep their their um, homestead protection. So you can actually you can actually have uh, a bank account that's protected by the by the Florida homestead law because it's waiting to be in, invested in a in a new um in a new investment in a new homestead. Now, as I was saying, Florida has a lot of strong asset protection laws, well, one of which is, is uh, if you hold your, your property as tenants by the entirety, it, it, it's protected. Uh, tenants by the entirety is a special joint ownership where the wife and the husband each own an interest, uh, one half interest in the property. And, it, and if, uh, if, if there are debtors that, that, are, that uh, are coming after just the husband or just the wife, they can't touch it if it's in tenants by the entirety. It, the only way they could get to the land, but this it's in the name of tenants by the entirety, is if both both the husband and the wife are on the debt. Now, th th this is important because quite often in, in Florida we 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 title the we title the property or the homestead as in the name of the husband and wife, and so if if the deed says Jane Doe and and Joe Doe, husband and wife, under Florida law, that's tenants by the entirety. So. And, and if it's your homestead, you have really double asset protection because you have not only the homestead protection, but the tenants by the entirety protection. And I'll talk about tenants entirely later on. Just want to get that concept out. Okay. The, the next, the, the next aspect of homestead protection is the Florida homestead exemption. This is an exemption for for for, for property tax purposes. If you if you have your exemption on your home. There, 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 there's a fifty thousand dollar exemption from value, and there's some other little exemptions. There's an exemption if you're for um, disabled people who are over who are over sixty five. 
for disabled veterans, for people who are, are surviving spouses of first responders or someone killed in, in, a, um, in, in, in a military action. But uh, th th this is not really where the action is. Well, what's very important about the homestead exemption is if you get the homestead exemption, you, you, you qualify for something called Save Our Homes. And what Save Our Homes says is that if, uh, if this is your homestead and you have the exemption, the, the, the value of the property for, for, for property tax purposes cannot be increased by more than 3% per year or the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, whichever is less. So basically, if it's my homestead and, and, and the property is, is going up in value by a, a huge amount, the value cannot be increased by more than 3% per year for purposes of, of, of valuing it for, for property taxes. Now that's just the, the value of the property. The, the tax rate can go up, but the value of the property cannot be increased by more than 3%. Well, this is really huge because I, I don't know, if you have a house near the water that's just really going up in value, I, I mean, I've known people that, that'll, that have had the homestead exemption for many, many years on the house. And they'll actually say, you know, if I had to pay the taxes that my neighbor's paying, I don't know if I could even afford to keep this house anymore. And everyone wants to keep that cap. We call it that three percent the cap. Every I mean that's the name of the game. Keep your keep your three percent cap. You you uh, when typically in Florida when we uh, do estate planning we we don't really do wills anymore. We do revocable trusts or some people call them living trust. You put all your assets in the trust, and then the trust says who gets gets what when you die and you avoid probate. And everyone wants to avoid probate in Florida. Some some people come to my office and say, I want to avoid probate. Yeah, I want to the living trust. And what is probate anyway? They don't know what probate is, but they want to know, they definitely want to avoid it. Well, you can put your home in your, in your, in your trust, in your local trust, you keep your 3% cap. The only time you lose the 3% cap is if you give the home away or, or if you are uh, on your death and it moves on to the to the next generation whatever you leave it to well then that's when you lose your cap so that and sometimes in some of these estate planning transactions we may lose our cap if we if we put it in the cupid or uh, give it away but i mean the, we really everyone wants to keep the cap that's like very important now an, another very important feature of this um of this um this save our homes or the cap is that if you if you sell your home and buy another home you can you can train Transfer that cap to the new home. This is, this, they, they refer to this as portability, but it has nothing to do with the estate tax portability that came into the law later. Florida was the first to come up with this term portability, but it has, it has to do with the real estate taxes. So for example, if I have a, a house that uh, maybe I've, it is valued at half a million for, um, for uh, property tax purposes, but the real value without the cap would have been a million, and then I sell the house and buy another house. Well, I can transfer that cap. So if I buy, so uh, if the new house were worth a million, you you I could reduce it by five hundred thousand for for property tax purposes, and it's only worth five hundred thousand. And uh, the, the 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 maximum that you can transfer from this cap is half a million. It, it would be less, of course, if your built-in untaxed gain is less. And the port to, to, to get this portability, you have you have uh, approximately two to three years to, to buy a new house. And the reason I say two to three years is it depends on when you sell the house. The three years starts running from the first day of the year when you, you sell your house. So if you sell your house in January, you basically have three years. But if you sell your house in, in at the end of the year, well, then you really only have two years because uh, the, the three years start running at the beginning of the year. Now, the, 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 the one thing about homestead exemption is you must apply for it. It's not like for, for the asset protection feature of homestead, you, if, if it's your homestead, it's your homestead, no one can touch it. If someone tries to sue you and, and tries to seize the house, you file some, some, some uh, notice saying, this is my homestead, you can't touch it, but you don't have to go register anywhere for that. But for the, for the tax, for the exemption for tax purposes, you actually have to go and, and register your red and apply and register. And the, the, re and the reason why you always want to apply is not only to get the cap, but it's also to become a, to become a Florida resident. A lot of people are moving down from, uh, from up north. They want to become a Florida resident. They want to get, get out of the tax system up north and they want to down to Florida. We have no income taxes, so they want to be Florida residents. 
And what do you have to do to be a Florida resident? Well, it's sort of a facts and circumstances test. You have to register to vote. You have to, you have to have all your, basically Florida has to be your center of gravity. Your, your doctors, your lawyers should be down here. Your, your, your synagogue or your church should be down here. Your club should be down here. You have to have as many contacts as possible in Florida to be a Florida resident. Well, one of the items on the list is, did you apply for the homestead exemption? So that's another reason for applying. You know, you definitely want to get it, but uh, everyone wants to, wants to get that cap. That cap can be a huge savings. <laughs> okay, so okay, so, so we, we, went, we went through the first feature of homestead, the asset protection, which is wonderful. The second feature of is the, uh, the save our homes, which, uh, which gives you a, a break on the, on the uh, on the property taxes, and it it it, it limits how much the your, your home can be raised in value per year, for purpose of the property taxes. Now, the third feature, which is something that I really come into contact with all the time, is the devised restrictions. If your if your home is subject to the home to the homestead rules, or if it's a homestead, there are restrictions on who you can leave your home to, and the whole idea behind this is. You don't want to. You don't want somebody to die and leave the home to some friend or some third party, and and there's a surviving spouse and minor children, and they kicked out. They get kicked out of the home. So if you have a spouse or minor children, the Florida homestead laws are the undevised say it has to go a life estate to the surviving spouse, and 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 the remainder to all the children, not just the surviving children, but to all the children. So. Well, why is this a problem? I mean, it's, it, it seems very logical and very fair and sim simplistic, but it, it, it leads to a lot of problems because nowadays we have the, you know, we have second families, we have spouses, second spouses, we have children from a prior marriage. We have sometimes people want to leave the homestead to one set of children and some other assets to, some, to, uh, to another set of children. In the typical case where you want to leave the wife the right to use it and the wife's death, leave it to the children, it works fine, but it doesn't. It doesn't always work that way. So what, so what do we do? Well, what do we do if we want to get out of the homestead rules? Uh, let me, let me, for example, suppose I want to leave my 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 um, my homes my homestead to one daughter and, and some other piece of property that's not the homestead to a second daughter. Well, under the homestead rules, you can't do that. So how do you how do you get around it? Well, if 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 there are no minor children. The spouses can waive their homestead rights, and then and then you can do anything you want with it. If there, but if there are minor children, you can't because the spouse can waive her rights to the homestead, but the spouse cannot waive the, the minor children's rights. So, uh, what in a case like that, what do you do? Well, if you hold the home as tenants by the entirety, and I talked about that before, that's a special ownership where it's in the in the name of the husband and the wife. And on, on the death of one, it passes automatically to the survivor. Well, in, in that sort of a case, it, it'll, it'll go to the survivor and you don't get in and, and it overrides the homestead laws. But you, know, you don't always want to do that. You don't, uh, maybe that's not the plan. Maybe the plan is to, to put it in a trust and let the, the wife have the right to use it. And then on the wife's death, we leave it to, the, uh, to, the, to certain children. So what do you do? Well, first of all, as I said, in Florida, we have we always use revocable trust. At least I do. I haven't done a standalone will in, in many years. Everyone wants a revocable trust. Well, when you put it in the revocable trust, if the homestead laws apply, the revocable trust provisions don't apply. The homestead laws still apply. So how do you even get the property into the revocable trust and then have the homestead law not apply and, and let the trust provisions apply? Well, as, as I said, you can waive your rights if there, if there are no minor children. And a law has recently been passed in the past couple of years that says you can actually put language in the deed when you're transferring the home to your revocable trust that, that, that says uh, I'm, we're waiving our rights and that, that works as long as there are no minor children. Now, if there are minor children, there's a problem. You just can't do it. I had a, we had a recent case where the, the husband had a very large, house, expensive house. It was maybe a $10 million home. A second marriage, children from grown children from a prior marriage who didn't really probably get along with the new wife very well. He, and he put, every, want, put everything in his revocable trust, which is fine, but he wanted to provide in the trust on my death, it goes to my wife. He did not want to put it in joint name because you know, he wanted to keep it in his name. 
So, the, but the problem is there's a minor child, so it's not going to work. The homestead laws are going to apply to that, and it's going to go life estate to the wife, remainder interest to all the children. Now, you can end up with a real mess here because, it, as I said, the homestead laws leave a life estate and a remainder interest. If there are no minor children, you can leave it all to the spouse. So let's say that in this case, there was one minor child. Well, the, the trust isn't going to control it. It's going to be uh, a, a life estate in the name of the wife, principal remainder in, in the name of the children, all the children. Now, what happens if the wife wants to sell the house and buy a, a, a different house? Well, the only way she can do that, since it's not, in a, if it had been in a trust, that the, there could have been provisions that say, and then normally, oh, the trustee can sell the house and buy a replacement house or buy a smaller house. And if they're uh, un, un, reinvested proceeds, the, uh, the trustee can then uh, leave the money in the trust and the spouse can get the benefit of that and it can be invested or, or whatever. Well, that can't happen if, if it's the life estate remainder under the homestead laws. If you want to sell it, you need the consent of all the, of all the remainder beneficiaries, including, in my case, these adult children. And then if you sell it, who gets the proceeds? Well, the law doesn't say. I mean, you can't just keep it neatly in the trust and the wife gets to keep using it. Everyone has to agree. So if the, if the children agree to sell it, they're going to want their money right now. They're not going to want to let, let the wife keep using the money. You know, if, if this is the, these are the children from the first marriage. So what, so, so what, what do you do? Uh, well, in, in this particular case, there was nothing we could do. We, we waived the rights, but it wouldn't work if the, if the, if the husband were to die before that, that, that newly born child turned 18. So in this case, what we, we, there, these are some very wealthy people and there was some very major trust for these adult children. And we basically put in some provisions that say, if you don't cooperate with the surviving spouse or she wants to sell the house, you're going to get some very serious penalties in your trust. And I mean, that's the way we, in that particular case. But basically, you know, you, you have to waive your rights. Now, we, what, what, we, what I get quite often is somebody moves down here from up north. Their documents were done by their attorneys up north. They have special homestead, homestead special provisions for the homestead. It's not going to, it's going to go to just certain children. And, uh, and, and, and no one really addresses the homestead laws. Well, I had one that, that happened just like that just recently where the, the revocal trust says on my death, my homestead goes to one daughter and this other piece of property goes to the other. Well, it didn't work, it, it couldn't work. And the, you know, the, every, they were all adults. The wife could have easily waived her homestead rights you know, when this was all done, but the lawyers didn't do that. So, th so then we got to think, well, what can we do? Can the wife, can the wife waive her what rights now? Not now that the husband is dead? No, because what happens under the homestead laws when the husband dies, as, under operation of law, the wife becomes vested with a life estate and the children become vested with this remainder interest. Well, how, how can the wife, by, by, by then waiving her rights after the fact, cause this remainder interest that are now owned by the children to go away? Well, she can't, and there's there some, some case laws that say that. So then we got into a thinking, well, maybe the wife can disclaim, and then the and the, then the daughter who's not supposed to get the property can disclaim. Because you know, you can disclaim, and if you if you follow the, the Internal Revenue Code, it's a qualified disclaimer, there's no taxable gifts. So then, but then the problem was the, the daughter who was disclaiming had children, and those children had children, and there was some unrecovered people in down the line. In, in, in the um, ownership line who would, who it would go to. And we would have to get all those people to disclaim and there's no way we could have gotten them all to disclaim. It, really, it never would have happened. So what we ended up doing was the daughter who got the, the remaining interest who wasn't supposed to get it ended up making a gift to the other daughter and using part of her, ex her gift tax exemption which wasn't the best thing to do because she could have used that for something else. But in this particular case, just because the, the proper planning wasn't done and, the, and the, the, the wife did not disclaim her, did not renounce or, or waive her interest in the homestead before all, before all this was done. We ended up having to use uh, estate tax exemption unnecessarily. So, I mean, it's very important to, uh, to really consider the homestead laws when you do deal with estate planning, when you put it in your trust, when you're, even if, you, even if, you're, just, even if you're just putting it in the trust and it's gonna go, 
uh, the, the wife will have the right to use it and the children will, will get it at, on, the, on the surviving spouse's death, you still wanna put it in the trust because you wanna have, have provisions that allow the trustee to sell it and reinvest the proceeds and without having to go get the permission of all the children and get into to that old cold hoopla. Well, when you, in order to get in the trust and have the, have the, trust, the trust govern rather than the, the, the homestead laws, you, you have to waive the rights. So typically we, in, our, in our deeds, when we transfer it to the revocable trust, we always have, have this language saying that the, the spouse are waiving their homestead rights and that's fine as long as there are no minor children. And 99% of the time, they, they, the, the, the people we're dealing with are older people, they never have minor children. So the, the, uh, the, what, what we need to remember when it, when it comes to this is, you know, yeah, fraud is great. Uh, asset protection laws, the homestead is, is wonderful to, to, uh, to, to, to put your property out of the reach of creditors. We have good, good laws that, that allow you to, to reduce your tax liability with this 3% cap. But when you get ready to, to deal with the disposition of the homestead in, in your will or your local trust, you really need to take into effect the, home, the homestead laws and be sure you don't run afoul of them and try to try to get out of them and to the best extent possible. Because if you don't, you can, you can end up like my client who had to uh, make a taxable gift to, to work all this out after the fact when it could have all been, been done properly in the first place and none of this would have ever happened. Now, an, another way I, I, I I've been able to avoid homestead laws. If everyone's agreeable, if, if the, the proper waivers aren't, the, the property's put in the trust, but the proper waivers aren't done, then the husband dies. And then now, now the trust doesn't really have good title because it was homestead property. So what, what do you do? Uh, you know, you want to keep it in the homestead, the, the trust wants to sell the property. Well, what, what I did in one case was, this was a case where the, the, the property was in the name of the husband and wife and the, both the husband and wife signed the deed to put it in the trust. Unlike the case I talked about before, where the, um, in, in that case, the, 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 the husband took title in the trust, the, the wife never signed anything. So in this case, the second case where the husband and wife each signed the deed to put it in the trust, well, the husband, the, the, well, the wife, the way it works is when, when there's a homestead involved, you go to court and you get an order determining its homestead. And then there's an order saying it's homestead, the wife has a life estate, the children have a remained in interest. But well, we went to court and got an order determining it's not homestead. The wife just simply in her petition said, well, when I signed this deed to put it in the trust, it was my intention to waive the rights. So I waived my rights. It's, it's not subject to the homestead laws on device. And I mean, everyone was given the right to, uh, to, 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 con to, uh, to contest this if they didn't like it. Of course, the, the children aren't gonna go in and, and fight their mother. So it, it all, and, and I thought this was a much better way than trying to get everyone to, to sign off on, on, on disclaimers. We actually got an order saying, well, it's not homestead. So then the, the, the trust had good time, they could do what they wanted with it and everything was fine. So I, again, I mean, you know, Florida has wonderful asset protection laws. It, ha it has wonderful laws to protect the homestead and, and see to it that the, that the children and the, and the wife aren't kicked out when the owner dies. But you have to do the proper planning because this these laws came into effect many many years ago when things were different, and you know the, 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 these devised rules don't always apply today, based on what you want to do with your estate plan. So you need to really be sure that a Florida lawyer is looking at this, and and being sure that the homestead is properly provided for in your estate plan, or else it could you could end up with this case like I, I mentioned where you ended up to fix it, we ended up having to make taxable gifts unnecessarily. Well, I, I think that that's about all I have. If there are any questions, uh, yeah, I, 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 uh, we can, I'll send you my information. You have to be, feel free to call me. I, this, I just start touching on the highlights. I think that's really about all the time I have. But thank you so much. Great, great. Thank you, Eugene. Just, um, just two quick questions from the audience. Okay. Um, uh, what happens if you put the homestead in an LLC? Okay. This happens sometimes. People create LLCs for asset protection, which can be you know, LLC. It's particularly Delaware LLC is really good for that. Florida is not as good. And and but I always tell them, well, don't put your your um don't put your homestead in the LLC because you have really good asset protection outside of the LLC. But if you put it in the LLC, you you.
you don't qualify for the homestead exemption, you lose your 3% cap. And everyone, I mean, you want to keep that 3% cap. So keep the homestead out of your LLCs. It's, it's, it's yeah, really good asset protection. You don't need to put an L, a homestead in an LLC. Great, great. And, and then the last question, um, in the case of a married couple, do both spouses have to live in the home for the homestead rules to apply? No, I mean, it's, it's, it's not common, but you don't have to. Like I, I have one client now who, who it's a couple, the husband has, wants to be in Florida for asset protection purposes, but the wife does not. And uh, the, uh, the husband also wants to avoid the income tax. But the problem is the wife isn't doesn't have really much incentive to move to Florida because all her income is 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 is, is sourced in another state, so she's gonna have to pay tax in that other state anyway. Mm -hmm. So what they're doing is the husband's gonna become a, a Florida resident and get his homestead, and the wife will stay, you know, can maintain her residency up north. So that mm -hmm. can be done. Now the the one caveat is who whose name will the homestead be in? If the homestead is only in if the homestead is in joint name. Well, that's fine for asset protection because uh, it, it's tensed by the entirety or it should be tensed by the entirety. So it's protected from creditors anyway. But as far as the homestead protection goes, if it's in, if it's in joint name, only, only the husband's half will be, will be protected by the homestead laws and only the husband's half will get the cap. So really what, what I would say to these people is if you're going to do this, which I think they are, Put the homestead in the husband's name since he's going to be the sole Florida resident. We want to we want to get the 100 of the home to have homestead protection. So I, that's probably what they'll do. Great, great. All right. Well, well, thank you very much, Eugene. Um, okay. And then so um, I'll I'll be doing the last presentation here uh, to, to wrap up this webinar, um, and and this is going to be on recent. Um, statutory amendments to the general corporation law of the state of Delaware and the Delaware alternative entity statutes. Uh, can you do the next slide, please? All right, so um, again, I'm Rick Carroll. I'm a uh, partner in the corporate department here. Um, a lot of my practice revolves around kind of structuring loans and uh, credit financing in connection with uh, large real estate transactions, as well as kind of drafting organizational documents like LLC agreements and LP agreements and kind of preparing the, the org structures that are used as part of these real estate transactions. Um, I also frequently give uh, legal opinions on behalf of borrowers to lenders as part of these real estate transactions. Uh, so next slide, please. All right here. Um, so, so again, we're going to be speaking about the, the amendments uh, to the alternative entity statutes and the general corporation law. Um, and then um, although it's not uh, a Delaware law, I, I want to briefly discuss the, the new federal law, the Corporate Transparency Act. Um, now, I, I guess the first question to, to kind of always bring up here uh, is why Delaware? You know, why are we discussing Delaware uh, when the CLE is, is about real estate uh, financing and real estate transactions? And I think it's really important um, that, that real estate professionals have at least a, a basic understanding of, of Delaware corporate and LLC and LP laws. Um, you know, just given that lenders, um, you know, will, will typically want to see the use of Delaware entities um, as part of, you know, as, as part of uh, financing transactions. I mean, typically you see an LLC or an LP structure, uh, and obviously more and more often you're seeing Delaware statutory trust use as part of uh, 1031 exchanges. Uh, and they'll just kind of very briefly when it comes to terminology, um, all of these um, you know, every type of entity uses a different statute. Uh, and so I'll be jumping back and forth between terms a little bit here. Uh, corporations are governed by the general corporation law of the state of Delaware, uh, also known as DGCL. LLCs are governed by the LLC Act. Um, uh, limited partnerships are governed by the Delaware Revised Uniform Limited Partnership Act, uh, also known awkwardly as DRULPA or the LP Act. Uh, and then general partnerships are go governed by the Delaware Uniform, the Delaware Revised Uniform Partnership Act, or DRUPA. Um, the one thing I note, uh, there were no changes this year to the Delaware Statutory Trust Act, uh, and so I, I won't really be speaking about them today. Uh, now, I guess the other important thing to realize here is that, you know, Delaware as a, a state kind of goes out of its way uh, to be really on the cutting edge of, of corporate 
uh, matters. Um, and so as part of this every year, the, the Delaware Bar works closely with the General Assembly to propose new legislation uh, to each of these statutes. And so just what that process looks like, the General Assembly is generally in session from January to June of each year um, and typically adopts amendments to the corporate code uh, suggested by the Delaware Corporate Bar uh, sometime in mid-June. Those are then generally signed into law by the governor at the end of June or early July and typically take effect in August. Sometimes there, there's kind of exceptions to that August start date, uh, but, but for the most part, it's August 1st. Um, so um, you'll typically see kind of a flurry of corporate law updates uh, from, from Delaware corporate lawyers e each summer. Uh, now, I'll, I'll say that the last couple of years of these amendments ha have been a little boring, um, and they've been rather technical in, in, in nature. Uh, but you will see, and we'll be discussing it here for a few minutes, that a number of these amendments um, are passed by the General Assembly uh, directly in response to uh, the Delaware Supreme Court and the Delaware Court of Chancery's decisions. Um, and that may very well be the, the courts have, you know, have expressly asked the General Assembly to make changes or that the, the General Assembly was not happy with the outcome um, of certain litigation. Uh, but there really is a, a real back and forth between kind of these players, between the, the corporate bar, the, the General Assembly and the Delaware courts when it comes to these, um, uh, these acts. Um, so, you know, I think we're going to start this with the alternative entity statutes for a couple of reasons. Um, typically, I would start with the corporate uh, code, uh, the DGCL updates, but, but frankly, this year, the DGCL updates were really um, unexceptional. And for purposes of this presentation specifically, you know, you t you're more, much more likely to use LLCs or LPs, um, or in some instances, Delaware statutory trusts rather than corporations. So I wanted to focus on those. Um, uh, I, I may often kind of just refer to the alternative any statutes, again, the LLC Act, the LP Act, and the Partnership Act together. And that's because in most instances, um, all three of those statutes are updated together. And so kind of the exact language is used in each one of the amendments for those statutes, which was generally not the case with the, uh, the DGCL where the statute just works uh, in a sufficiently different way that it doesn't make sense to do that. Um, all right, so the, the first amendment we have here goes to the ratification of void and voidable acts. Um, these were sections, uh, amendments that were made to each of the alternative entity statutes. Um, these were done expressly to permit the ratification or waiver of void or voidable actions. And so just uh, for a terminology perspective here, a void act is one where an entity lacks the power or capacity to take a, a particular action. So I think the classic example of that, and the one I think I'm always dealing with, is where a, um, a corporation uh, has tried to issue more shares of stock than its corporation allows. That act, you know, the corporation is just not allowed to do that. And so that act would be deemed void. Avoidable act, on the other hand, is, is an action taken by an entity that is, is in theory in the entity's power, but, um, but it was not properly authorized. So kind of, I, I think the, the classic example of that would be, you have an LLC agreement that might require, say, a supermajority vote of the members in order to uh, enter into a, a loan. Um, the, the, the LLC doesn't get that necessary vote, but enters into the loan anyway. That action would be voidable. Um, now, these amendments uh, were in response to kind of two cases over the last few years, um, we, one at the Delaware Supreme Court and one at the Delaware Court of Chancery, uh, Cop Secure versus Cardux, and Absalom Absalom uh, Trust versus St. Gervais. Both of those cases uh, held that certain LLC actions were void under the LLC agreement and thus could not be ratified by the members. Uh, so the idea of these, these, the, these amendments was to create a, a safe harbor provision that would allow the, uh, the members or the managers or the other relevant party whose um, approval would be required to take an action um, to ratify those actions. Um, and so you could do this by either um, a, you know, approving the void or voidable action or by amending the, the relevant agreement to permit 
that the action would be validly taken. Um, when you do this ratification under these new sections, um, the, the ratified act or transaction um, is deemed effective um, as of the time the transaction took place, not at the time of the ratification. So it, it looks back in time. Uh, to the extent your agreements require kind of any, any notice to be given um, uh, for the underlying act, then you would need to give that same notice uh, as part of the ratification process. In other words, you can't ratify an action in an attempt to avoid notifying relevant parties. Uh, lastly, these new amendments create a process by which um, you can go before the, the Delaware Court of Chancery um, and, and make a claim that you were uh, substantially and adversely uh, you know, negatively affected uh, by the ratification or, or waiver, um, and it lets the, the Court of Chancery consider that. Now, I, I will say um, that, uh, that right to go to the Court of Chancery um, goes only to the harm that you would suffer from the ratification itself, not from any harm you would suffer from the, uh, the underlying act, say if it had been taken um, at, at the appropriate time with, you know, with, the, with the appropriate votes. Now, I suspect that this act, um, this, these amendments are gonna be really the most used kind of anything I'm gonna be speaking about today. Um, and, and I say that just because a few years ago, um, there was a corollary amendment done to the DG, DGCL called um, Section 204, which allowed for the rat ratification of uh, defective acts. Um, and, and that Section 204 is a rather complicated process. Um, there, there's a number of uh, steps you need to take, uh, but it does allow you to fix you know, void actions taken by your clients. Um, what I've seen kind of time and time again is you have uh, clients, especially at the startup level, uh, who are who are running in a you know a number of directions at the same time probably have an engaged um, you, you know a legal counsel at the time might be using uh, legal zoom type services and they they make a mistake but before the um, the section 204 went into effect it was rather difficult um, to kind of fix a lot of these issues because you couldn't necessarily go back in time to ratify the uh, the actions uh, nail the statutory process in place. Uh, you know, for all of the entity levels, lets you fix this. Um, and I think it gives a lot of people comfort and I expect it, it'll make the process cleaning up the things, you know, before a larger corporate transaction, such as taking out a loan or selling uh, your LLC. I suspect that will make that process much easier. Uh, all right, uh, next slide, please. Okay, um, uh, next up are just some amendments relating to uh, information and inspection rights. Um, just kind of, you know, very generally, um, LLCs and LPs and partnerships uh, typically give their members and partners information rights. Uh, this was a concept that was pulled over from corporate law, where, um, where there was some information that was just deemed um, so important to stockholders and directors that they were always allowed to demand that information. Uh, and the corporation really has no choice but to provide it. I uh, know there's been there's been countless cases over the years about what what that information looks like, what demands are proper, what demands are improper, and, and I would say I'm, I'm pretty much always in at least one fight uh, at any given time where I'm representing either a stockholder or a director um, uh, or a member or manager uh, or the the corporation or the LLC uh, in one of these fights. Uh, now um, the alternative entity statutes have kind of largely co-opted. Uh, this concept from the DGCL, but, but as I mentioned earlier, the language really it works in a different way. Um, and so while you look to the DGCL's case law on this, it's really not always a perfect corollary. Um, uh, but in any event, um, these new amendments um, you know, came in because they were amended to clarify that um, a member's or partner's right to information uh, for a particular purpose for an entity uh, must be to obtain such information as is, and, and the, here's the, the important language, as is necessary and essential to achieving that purpose. Um, uh, and so, um, you know, you can expand that in, your, in the, uh, the LLC or LP amendment agreements. You can, um, you know, you can expand and narrow that to say, to say what constitutes this necessary and essential information. This was made in response to a, um, a recent Delaware Supreme Court case uh, called Murphy versus WHC Venture LLC, um, where the Supreme Court found that a partnership agreement 
did not impose a uh, necessary and essential test. And thus, the, uh, uh, thus without more, the partner was really able uh, to go after whatever information uh, it wanted. Uh, the, the purpose for this necessary and essential qualification is that you really want, the courts really want to limit uh, fishing expeditions. Um, a member or partner seeking uh, information should only be able to demand information, again, necessary and essential uh, to the purpose that the member has told the company or the partnership that it needs the information for. So for instance, if you're um, uh, you know, if you're if you want to see a list of the stockholders and you want to know who your, your your fellow stockholders are, you might not be able to ask for information relating to say, the financial information of the company because that wouldn't really be necessary and essential to uh, you know your your purpose of learning who the stockholders or members are. Uh, no, well, just a few drafting tips on this. Um, you know, when I'm representing an entity, uh, especially when I'm, rep um, I'm drafting the LLC agreement or the LP agreement, you know, my goal is generally to narrow the scope of the available information rights as much as possible. At the very least, I want to try to identify um, kind of, you know, information that can reasonably request it, be requested by the member and otherwise try to limit vague uh, general information requests. Uh, and the reason for this is, is really simple. Um, members and partners are not typically seeking this information just because they're interested. Um, they're generally unhappy with how the, the LLC or the LP is being operated. And so they want to uh, you know, use this, uh, these in information rights uh, as the first step in litigation. On the other hand, uh, when I'm representing an investor, uh, of course we wanna have inspection rights um, and generally I say, listen, I, I'm an investor. I uh, should be able to have a wholesome understanding of what the company is doing. And of course, since you have nothing to hide, there should be no reason for you not to give this to me. Um, when I'm representing a, a very significant investor, I, I really do demand this. And to the extent um, for, for uh, political reasons, uh, the company doesn't feel like it can put it in the LLC agreement or the LP agreement, I generally, uh, demand that a, uh, a side letter is put into place giving my clients in particular information rights, even if the other members and partners don't have those. Uh, all right, uh, next slide, please. Okay, this is a, another instance um, where I think we're going to see a, a lot of, um, it's gonna, uh, the lawyers are going to use this these amendments a lot in the next few years. Each of the alternative entity statutes uh, were amended to clarify that a member, manager, or partner uh, may delegate any of its rights, powers, or duties, um, irrespective of whether it has a, a conflict. So if one of those persons has a conflict uh, and, and tries to delegate it to a person who does not have a conflict, then that, delegate, uh, that delegated person would be able to, to take those actions. Um, this was another case um, uh, that you know, came in response to a, a decision by the Delaware courts. Uh, in Wenske versus Bluebell Creameries, the court of chancery held that a conflicted principal did not have the right um, under the LLC Act to, um, uh, uh, to delegate uh, its authority to a, a non-conflicted person. This was done under general agency rules that, that said an agent is generally subject to the same conflicts as the person delegating to the agent. So this amendment reverses that rule and uh, provides for a broad delegation of, of managerial authority um, by conflicted persons. Um, that delegation can also occur, um, be, be done by a committee of the LLC or the partnership. And so I, I expect we're going to see this amendment done, uh, you know, where, where boards of managers and, and maybe, you know, maybe the general partners um, have, you know, conflicts as a way to get around those conflicts. Um, all right, next slide, please. Um, all right, so just because I know we're getting to the end here, I'm gonna um, run through these really quickly. Um, there, there've been a couple uh, amendments regarding public benefit entities. Um, you know, public benefit entities typically don't, um, uh, you know, you're not gonna really see them in the real estate context, but Delaware allows, uh, you know, corporations, LLCs and LPs to register as public benefit entities. Um, and you know, the idea here is that they would be for-profit entities, but that exist to produce a public benefit, uh, not just, for instance, the maximization of, um, 
of uh, stockholder profits. Patagonia is a classic example of this. Uh, it's a for-profit company that very clearly says in its charter, you know, we exist for an environmental purpose. Um, Delaware, uh, you know, importantly though, Delaware doesn't say, um, you know, it doesn't make any attempt to verify that you, 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 what you're doing is actually for a public benefit or that how you're operating actually is in, within, is, is in line with your goals. That's really up to you um, and in principle to the other stockholders, uh, uh, stockholders and members and partners to make sure you're acting appropriately. Uh, these amendments this year really just require that to the extent you're going to have a public benefit, you need to identify yourself as having um, that public benefit, uh, as well as specify the specific uh, public benefits that you're trying to accomplish uh, in your LLC agreement and your LP agreement. Um, what's interesting is that to the extent um, you, you have one public benefit um, uh, statement in your limited partnership certificate or in your LLC certificate, and that conflicts with what's in your operating agreement or partnership agreement, what's in the agreement's controls which is obviously a um, reverse of what you typically see, uh, which is where what's ever in the certificates that you would file with the state of Delaware would control. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, this is actually just a really technical amendment involving general partnerships, which allows in certain instances uh, uh, general partnerships to opt out um, of certain provisions of the Partnership Act, but to the extent they, um, they choose to opt out, um, or will be governed by the other, um, uh, other provisions of the Partnership Act. Again, very, very technical, and I wouldn't spend any time worrying about that. Um, next slide, please. Um, all right, so Neil, um, most importantly, uh, CL, um, if you all can take note of the CLE code um, at the bottom of this slide, 24688. Again, CLE code uh, 246. Um, I'm going to leave that up on the screen for a minute. Um, I'm actually going to skip uh, this DGCL amendment because it's very technical in nature. And just in the next uh, minute or so, briefly discuss the Corporate Transparency Act. Uh, but, but please leave this slide up just so everyone can keep uh, that uh, CLE code on the screen. Um, the Corporate Transparency Act, I think, is something that real estate uh, professionals should really know about. Uh, it came into effect. Um, uh, it's a federal law that came into effect on January 1st, 2021. Um, it was uh, uh, Congress overrode President Trump's veto to put this into law. Um, what it's going to do, it's going to require that you know, all entities, you know, in the, for the most part, all entities going forward um, upon their formation will need to register um, uh, with, the, uh, with FinCEN, uh, which is a part of the Department of Treasury. Um, and they're going to need to, uh, to list out who their beneficial owners are um, and certain other information about owner, ownership and control. And that information is going to be, have to be held, um, again, by uh, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network of the Department of Treasury. Um, you know, this is, this is really done in response uh, to trying to uh, limit the anonymity associated with, uh, with uh, shell companies such as those that are in Delaware such as Delaware LLCs and Delaware LPs. Um, while, you know, the, while the information required is not that complex, um, it is going to you know, add a, a new L reporting element upon the formation of entities. And I suspect that every single LLC or LP we create as part of kind of organizational structures for real estate transactions is going to need to make filings with FinCEN. Um, and so I, we are now at the 11.30 hour. Um, and so um, just to keep everyone on schedule here, I, I now will turn this um, over to Rachel for a few closing remarks. Thank you, Rick. And thanks to everyone at Saul Ewing. We enjoyed collaborating with you on this informative presentation. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to partner with you and provide today's participants with insight about Ocean First Bank's history and our mission to build strong community relationships. As Suzanne mentioned, Ocean First offers a full range of accounts and services tailored to meet the needs of our customers. If you're not familiar with Ocean First, please visit us at www.oceanfirst.com or stop by our new Center City branch located, located at 1500 Market Street starting Monday the 8th where you can meet members of our retail lending and trust teams. 
Thank you all for your participation today. And let me turn it back over to Rick for any additional closing remarks. Thank you. Perfect, perfect. Thank, thank you, Rachel. And Neil, just some final housekeeping items. Uh, this concludes today's training. Uh, if we did not get to your questions, we will do our best to follow up via email, or you can feel free to reach out to any of us. Our contact information is noted, noted on the screen now, maybe on the next screen. Um, remember to keep an eye out for the thank you email with links to the materials, and please be sure to complete the CLE survey if you are looking for that credit. Great. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate your time.